Let's do some programming. Okay, so um, what I want to what I want to program together is um, first a little object-oriented binary counter, which is sort of like the queue that we did, um, except it just it's in the single fragment, so it's a little bit easier. And then I want to do an amortized analysis in the style that Jan has presented on it, and the type checker will prove that our analyzed uh, amortized analysis is correct, or it will tell us it's wrong. Okay, so we'll find out about that. And then if, um, if there's still time and energy left, um, I want to show off not just the amount of uh, calculating the amount of work, but um, characterizing parallel time in the execution of these concurrent processes. So we'll write another piece of code at that point. Now, is this uh, big enough to see in the back? Or do I need a, okay, everybody can see it in the back? Okay, so what I want to implement is the counter and the implementation technique is um, pretty similar to what we had before for the queues. So the way we're going to do it is there's going to be a type of counter, um, and it's going to be like an object-oriented thing. It's going to be an external choice. And one option is to increment the counter. Right, so you can say increment, and then it behaves again like a counter. Okay, and then there's going to be later on. There's going to be a second option. Option we can request the value, and then we get the value back. But I'm beginning just having the increment because I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. It's not very useful because you can never observe the outcome of increment, but we'll make it useful later on. Okay. So the technique is the following. Let's say we have the number um, six, and the number six has three bits. Okay. Uh, one, one, zero, if you read from left to right. So we're going to represent each bit by process. So each process holds one bit. So it looks like this. So here we have the three bits. So this is going to be the rightmost bit is going to be bit zero. This one is bit one. This one is bit one. And they're plugged together like this. This counter C goes to the outside world. These are internal channels between the processes. And then the last one at the end, oops, there's no, um, there's an empty process that says this is the end of the bit string and doesn't hold any bit intuitively. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so now, if I send an increment along this channel, what should happen? We flip the bit, and how do we do that? Well, we actually, bit zero will call bit one and become a bit one, okay? So after that first step, everything else will be the same, and this one here will be executing, and it's still connected with C to the outside world, right? And this one is connected to this, and this, and so on, okay? Everybody with me? Pretty simple, right? Now, if I send another increment message, what happens? Yeah, so we have to flip the bit again now back to zero. But then we have to do the carry. So we have to send an increment message to here that will flip it, an increment message to here that will flip this. And then when the empty receives the increment message, it'll have to spawn a new process because the new representation is one bit longer. That process is bit one and another E at the end. Okay, are we okay on this? Okay, so let's write this code. Okay. Um, okay, counter .ss, okay. Okay, so we want to start with saying that we have the type of counter. So type counter equals, it's an external choice between one alternative for now, just to give us a counter. Um, okay, is that visible there in the back? Are we, I'm not sure if I hit the same, a little bit bigger, like this. Okay, all right, so now we want, we need to write three processes, right? We need to write empty, bit zero and bit one. So let's start with um, the types. So what's the type of bit zero? According to the picture over there. What's the type on the right? Well, it offers a counter, right? Okay, so it's going to be turnstile 
counter. And what does it have on the left? So this bit one also offers a counter. So it's a different implementation what we did before, right? Because this is also a counter, this is a counter, this is a counter. So bit zero is something that takes a counter and gives you another counter, right? So it's, uh, it's like the queues that we have. So it goes from counter to counter, okay? Um, now what's the type of bit one? Actually now I can probably turn off the lights so you can see this a little bit better. Um, maybe. Okay. So what's the type of bit one? Counter. counter to counter, right? It should be the same thing because it has a counter on the left and offers a counter to the right. And finally, proc empty. What should that type be? From nothing to counter, right? So we say from nothing to counter. Okay, so now we need to, to define these. Bit zero equals, so how does bit zero start? Look at its type. So it could do two things. It could either send a message this way or it could receive a message from here. What should it do? Case Yeah, it is a case write and there's only one possibility, it can get an increment. Yes? And what do we do once we receive the increment? Bit one. We call bit one. Okay? All right. Proc bit one. We do a case right. We see the increment message. And what do we do? Sending. We're sending to, to the left or to the right? Left. To the left, an increment message. And then we continue as. Bit zero, right? Because we have to flip it from one to zero. Right. And proc empty, we do a case right, we get an increment message. And then what do we do? Empty, empty in parallel with bit one. Okay, and in this last thing there, of course, the order of these two things is important, right? Empty has to be to the left and bit one to the right because bit one is the bit that has to sit at the interface. Okay, so um, let's see. I'm bold enough to try to compile this. Okay, um, so the way we compile it is to say um, ss and we give it this file, which, what did I call it? Counter. Okay, so everything type checks. So if you guys do your job, everything will always type check the first time and everything will run correctly the first time. Okay. Now one time when I taught an intro programming class at CMU, I told my students that and they laughed. Okay. But then it took up until the midterm before we actually made a mistake together. Okay. Um, so hopefully we can figure this out and get it work correctly. Okay, so now I want to actually run this code. So I want to process Let's call it, uh, what was it, six? Which has type counter, okay? And that's an abbreviation for nothing on the left and it provides a counter. Um, actually, wait, can we do this? Um, how should we define six? So, that's a red, so it represents the number six. Yeah, okay. So what's the leftmost one? Yeah, empty. empty. Bit one, bit one, bit zero. Anything else? Looks pretty good, right? Let's compile it. Okay, it works, okay. So now let's execute it. It doesn't do very much because I'm not doing any operations there. Okay. All right, so what does it show me down there? Um, okay, I'll put it as the thing one, makes it a little bit bigger. Okay, so it shows me 
the configuration, and the thing on the bottom there is the rightmost. The rightmost one, if I send an increment, it becomes one, so that's actually a bit zero, right? Right, because that's what the bit zero process is. And it becomes a bit zero, so that's a bit one. So it's actually zero, one, one, and then the empty process at the top. Right. So it's a little hard to read because it expanded definitions, but it does represent exactly that. Okay. So later on, we'll see some example where you can read the output more easily. Okay. Um, okay. So now I want to have the process eight, um, which is a counter, and oh, eight. So I want the process six in parallel with something that um, can you guess what I want to do? Send an increment to the left, followed by send an increment to the left, and then forward. Okay. Okay, let's see if we did that right. Okay, it compiles, um, which in this case means the type checks. And now we should be able to execute eight. And now when we compile it, it should actually give us the number eight. So let's see if that's a number eight. So the, the first thing, this process represents a bit zero, right? Because if you increment, you get one. So you have zero, 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 one, and then you have empty. Okay, so we've got the number eight. Okay, so, so far, so good. Um, okay, so it's not, um, it's good, but it's not great, okay? Um, so the next thing I want to do is, uh, we want to do an amortized analysis of a binary counter. Does anybody here know how to analyze a binary counter? Have you seen this in one of your classes? What I want to count with amortized analysis is that um, if you increment the counter, how many, how many bits do you have to flip? Anybody? Hmm? No, it's not log n. That's what, OK. So it's a very cool thing. You haven't seen it, OK? So I'll put it over here because that's where, the, uh, where we started. And um, OK, so if, it, if the least bit is 0, right, if the lowest bit is 0 like we have here, then we just flip one bit, right? So increment takes exactly one uh, bit flip. So that's very nice. But the problem is that that's not a very good bound, because in the case where they're all bit ones, then you have to actually flip log n. I mean, you have to flip three bits, right? And if you've counted up to seven, that's like log n bits. Um, so that's actually not a very good bound because um, you have incremented already n times and now you need to spend a lot more work. And so the Amatas analysis works as follows. Okay. Um, for what we're counting here now, the number of bits flips is equal to the number of increment messages flows, flows through the system. Okay. Because every increment that flows flips one bit. It doesn't matter if it arrives at bit one or at bit zero, right? The increment will flip it. And if, the, if it arrives here and it has to then flip this one, well, then the increment message from here to here will flip this bit, and so on. So every increment message exactly will flop, flip one bit. Okay, so what we're counting now essentially is the number of messages that flow through the system, okay? And the Amatas analysis is something like this. Um, when you increment, you have to spend one token to actually send the increment because the message costs one, one token, right? And what we also do is we send in another second token that we can use and pay off later for flips that come later on. And the claim is that with every increment, I just need two tokens. So it's actually an increment is an amortized constant cost operation on the counter, okay? So here's how this works. In this situation, I, so in the steady state, at every bit one, I have one token of potential that I have stored. So unlike in Jan's lectures, where potentials are stored in data structures in some sense, um, here the potential um, is stored in the process. So a process has a potential that is stored, and it gets it from the outside world, okay? So now if I send an increment, 
I want to send an increment, I need two tokens, right? That's what I said. And the way I'm going to spend these, I'm going to spend one to send the increment. And I spent a second to put on this bit one. Because every bit one must have one token left of potential. Okay. So after it sent those two in, then it looks like this. I have one token here. And then this is still bit one. And this is still uh, bit one. And this is empty. And at this point, I have a token here, I have a token here, I have a token here, and I can spin these for future send operations. Now, I want to do another increment, okay? So I have, start with two tokens over here. I spend one by just sending the increment message, and that leaves one token left over. So now, at this point, the bid one process has two tokens, right? Because it received one, because I used two, one to send and one to pass on. Now this process has two tokens. Now it's going to need to spend one of them in order to um, uh, send an increment message over here, which is a carry. Okay. And the second one, because every time you send an increment, you have to send an extra token. So after that, this bit one will, will become bit zero and have no tokens in it. So essentially it goes back to this situation. And what happens is that at that point, this is again bit zero. These two tokens have been spent, but I have two tokens here because I get one. Now this has the same choice. It has to send an increment that costs one token. It has to send a token because with every increment you have to send an additional token. Okay, so that's gone. It'll become bit zero. And this one here has two tokens. Okay. So this one here now has to send an increment message over here and so on. So after a couple of steps. It's bit zero, and I have one token over here, okay? And the one token over here I use to call bit one, okay, which is what this becomes, because bit one must have one token in the steady state, okay? And then the new empty process here, um, okay, so you know, see no matter whether you increment something that ends with a zero or ends with a one, I have exactly the right amount of tokens so that every bit zero process has none and every bit one process has one, okay? And since I only use two tokens, it means that overall the amateur test analysis says that I need exactly two n tokens, two n bit flips in order to increment the counter, okay? All right, so let's uh, try to actually express this in the type. So let's save this and let's make a new type, counter dash work, okay? Um, and we have to decide on the cost model. Um, and, okay, so to measure work, we want to measure the number of messages. We have to decide, is it going to cost to send or receive or both? Now, every message I sent is also received. Okay, so it doesn't matter. So I'm going to make the, the send cost one unit of time. Okay. And there's a number of other cost models that we have implemented um, in order to make this work. Okay, so now let's look at the type counter. Okay. Um, so after I send the increment, which cost me one token, I'm then required to send a token. Okay. And the way I send this token, which represents the potential that I have to transfer, um, we have a construct in the language that says which is like a little triangle, which is expressed like this. So what this says is that if I interact with a counter, I have to send a message, it's gonna cost me, and then I have to, even after that, I have to send one token across the network into the process, okay? All right, so now we need to think about how to, how to uh, type these processes, okay? Um, so bit zero goes from counter to counter, and I don't have to change that. Because bit zero, a bit zero process has no internal potential. There's nothing stored there. So I don't change that. But bit one, I have to express the fact that it has one unit of potential. So like uh, Jan, I'll put that in here and I'll say, okay, a bit one process has one unit of potential. This is my rendition of having it like above the turnstile. Okay. I don't keep track of high watermarks, so I don't need two different indices, just one. 
And the anti process carries no potential. It keeps look the same. Okay. Um, okay. And let's uh, comment out the examples for now. So if I played my cards right, okay, then this should now type check. Okay. And then we'll modify a little bit and see that it no longer type checks. Um, okay. So hopefully I did all this reasoning. Jan, do you want to stop me here or does it look good? It looks good. Okay. Um, counter dash work. All right. So it type checks. Okay. So, uh, Yeah, so what did I do? Oh, I didn't save it. Okay, that makes it work. Okay, let's try it again. All right, it type checks. Okay, so actually the type checker saying yes is a very poor test of this, right? Because I could have just had it always say yes and we would all be happy and go away, right? Um, so what you really need to do is make sure that it actually fails, right? When you have something wrong. So for example, if we do not send one unit of potential with every message, right, this should horribly fail. So this kind of failure is okay because we're actually testing to make sure it fails. Okay? And it says, indeed, in the five count of work, potential is not positive, true does not entail that zero minus one is greater or equal to zero. Okay? Um, and that's at line nine. Okay? So it's actually going to be exactly where you make the recursive call, okay? Um, so that's good. That's what we kind of want. Uh, so let me put it back to where it was supposed to be. Now the other thing we can do is um, we can ask it to print an explicit form by saying dash v, in this explicit form, all the transfer of potential is being made explicit in the code. You could actually use that as input syntax also, but it's much easier to just write it into the type, okay? So here is the code. So after reconstruct, it says there after reconstruction with model work equals sent and time equals none, okay? So you do a case write, you get an increment, okay? Um, and then you do work. Why do you do work? You do work because you want to send an increment to the left. And the cost model says increment costs. So we insert the tick, as, as um, uh, Jan called it, in the code here um, before we do the type checking. So that's that work after the get r. Then we send the increment. And then we have to pay because now it says we have to transfer one token okay, to the process which sits to our left. So we pay on the left, so that's what the pay left is. We transfer the token. And then we call, us out, then we call bit one. Um, okay, and um, where's the bit zero process? Um, Oh yeah, up there is a bit zero process because it doesn't have to send anything. So it gets the extra token um, from the left, uh, from the right that's being sent. That's the get R after it gets the increment. And then it calls it bit one. But bit one requires a potential of one. So doing that call, um, we pass that one potential to the bit one process. Okay, um, okay so that's how this works. Um, Okay, so let's uh, challenge ourselves a little bit here. Um, let's go back to the previous counter. Uh, okay, that's a little small. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to add to it the, the possibility of reading out the value of the counter, right? So the way we did that before that we specified in the interface that there's a second possibility here, which is we can ask for the value and we get a binary number, right? Now for that to work, we need to find the type of binary number, okay, which is an internal choice between B0, and then it's another binary number, or B1, and then it's a binary number, or E, and that means the number is finished, it's empty, so we 
just terminate the, the, the channel. Okay, does that make sense? Remember that? Okay. All right. So now if you try to type check it, of course it won't type check because each of these cases doesn't have the second possibility, right? So now we need to fill that in. All right. So previously this was trivial. In this one, it's a little trickier. Okay, so we're going, bit zero is asked to produce the value in binary form. How does it do that? It has to send something, oh, okay, it sends a value to the left, okay, to get the value of the higher bits, okay. What else? Yeah, so we need to send, because this process is the least significant bit and these are the higher bits. Zero has to send a B0 to the right, and bit one has to send a B1 to the right, right? Because it's the least significant bit. So the order of these two operations doesn't actually matter, I don't think. So we send B0, right? Because we are bit zero. And then, what do we do after that? Forward, right. Good, and so obviously we should be doing the type checking here um, to check that this works out, but okay, so let's actually do this because this is often what I do writing programs. Okay, after we receive a val, what does the typing actually look like? Make it comment. So on the left-hand side, it is counter, and on the right-hand side, after we receive val, what is it? bin, right? Because we have received the value message, so now then the continuation type is bin. Hmm? Make sense? Okay, so then after we send the val message to the left, what is the type at that point? What's the type on the left? And what's the type on the right? And why don't we just forward? We could, right? It would be type correct, but it would be the wrong number, right? Because we represent bin zero and we just ignore that, right? So we can't do that, so we can send bit zero. And then because the continuation type up here, if we send b zero, the continuation is again bin, it'll still be again b of type bin goes to bin. And then we can forward, and now it's the correct thing to do. Yes? Okay, so let's see if we can, using that model, if we are at bit one and we receive a value, what do we do? We send value to the left, okay. We send B1 to the right, and then forward. Okay, good. And here, if the empty process rep, uh, receives a val, what does it do? We send E to the right. Yeah, now we want to terminate. Okay, after we send E, what does the type look like? Okay. So after we send E, on the left, after we receive val, it is bin. Is that right? Oh, no, on the right it's empty, sorry, because this is the empty process, nothing on the right. On the right it's one. Okay, so we can just close that channel now, right? Nothing else to worry about. Okay, everybody agree that this makes some amount of sense? Okay, um, let's see if these examples still make sense. So for a counter, yeah, so that doesn't really change, does it? because it's still, increment is still part of the interface, so it should, should still compile. Okay, let's see if it works. Um, that's the counter without the work, right? Okay, let's see if it actually, yep, so you see, you say inconval is in there, so I, I didn't forget to save it this time. Okay, 
And the execution still does the same thing, except now the processes that are in the configuration that are waiting on a command, they're more complicated. And there's a spurious forward, which I don't really want to explain. Okay. All right, so that's the counter. And now we want to do um, change our work to account for that. Okay, so there's a second possibility, namely that we have value, and then we should become a binary number. And type binary number is an internal choice between B0, binary number, B1, binary number, or E, and we terminate. Okay, so now the question is, um, actually, let me copy the code from before. Um, because somehow the code shouldn't change. Okay. So the question is, how do we do? We need to change the types now for and the, the, our amortized analysis to make this work out. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so the bits process, when you, when you, when you um, give it a value, when you ask it to produce a value, it will send one bit to the right. And that requires one more token, right, in order to do that. Moreover, it will also have to send another val message to the left in order to get the value from the left. So it requires two more tokens, right, to store up. So the bit one process, Okay, should now have three tokens. Does that make sense? One for the message to increment, and two more to, to, to send back the bit that they are when the value is required, and one to send to require the value from the left, okay? And how much does a bit zero counter need? Before it needed none, but now? Two. Two, one less because it doesn't need to do the flip, okay? And now, what does the increment require? Whenever you send an increment, how many, how many um, tokens do you have to send to make the amortized analysis work out? So previously, we sent one. How many do we need to send? Three, right? One, oops, I need syntax. I need these curly braces, OK? So one as before, and then two additional ones to account for the later send of these things back. Um, that's a very good question. Okay. So the question is, how do we get the one token into the empty? And there's different ways to do that. I think the best way to do it is we, we provide those tokens when we ask for the values, rather than storing it in that process. Okay. So if we do that, then how many tokens do we have to supply when we ask for the value? Two? Two or one, okay. Well, we can play it safe, okay. And then we'll try and see if one will be enough. Um, actually, it turns out to be two, and the reason is that you need to send E, and then you need to send close, and close actually counts. Okay. If close didn't count, there was only one. Okay. So you couldn't possibly know that, but um, okay. So if I didn't mess up, okay, then this should not type check, um, and then we'll have to type check the examples. Um, okay. That's again counter tracking work. Okay. It works. Okay, we did it correctly. No, wait, we have to check that if you change something, it fails. Okay. Yeah, this is just a, I fall into this trap so many times, right? Okay, let's say we just send one, right? That shouldn't work. We just thought about that. Now, if it works, then we have to figure out why. Ah, okay. So it says the close R here, which I thought would be the culprit, right? There's insufficient potential. 
zero is not greater or equal to one. Right? So it exactly figured out where it actually goes wrong, where we don't have enough potential, because we need to close the channel and we spend the token to uh, send the E. So if you've worked with this for a while, you can read these error messages. Okay, so let's fix it back. Okay, so now we want to run an example. Okay, let's do the six first. So six of type counter will not work, right? Couldn't possibly work. Well, um, if we run this, let's see what error message it gives us. Okay, insufficient potential. Um, zero is not greater or equal to three. Okay, so we need to fix that. How do we fix that? <clears throat> We have to potential. We have to provide some potential on the outside. Um, so, how much potential should we give to this process? And that's what we have to put in these braces here. How much potential does it need? Three. That's an overestimate, right? Because the bit zero process and the empty process don't need any potential, just the bit one processes, right? So we just need two, hopefully. Um, okay, but let's see if uh, the implementation agrees with us. Okay, I've never tried this before. Okay. Insufficient potential. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I forgot, now we need, yes. So somebody who said six was probably right. I forgot that we uh, need these additional potential for the value request, right? And then it should be um, nothing here, two here, right? So this would be two, four, six, seven, eight, right? Make sense? Okay, so let's try that. Well, we can also do a binary search and figure out how much. That's how I did it. Yeah. Okay. But that's kind of a weak way out, right? We should at least, okay. Okay, success. It type checks. Okay. Um, and it also runs correctly. It's a little hard to read the output. It shows you on the left the potential that's left and the amount of work that these processes have done, okay? Which isn't much because they have done nothing at all, okay? Um, so this basically says that the process at the bottom has two units of potential left, has done zero amount of work. The next one has three potential, three potential, and the one at the top, zero. So because we just, um, nothing has happened yet, we haven't called the increment yet. So let's go back to that. Now I want to do the increment. Okay, so how do we do that? Okay. Um, any thoughts? How, how much potential should we now need? Okay, how much, how much Potential doesn't increment need to carry. Let's remind ourselves. An increment carries three, right? That we have up there. Okay. How many increments do we do? Two, so that should be that should be six, right? And then the eight, right? Should be fourteen. You agree with this? Okay, let's see. Okay, it doesn't work. What did we make? What did we do wrong? So the six requires eight, and then each increment requires three. Should be fourteen. Hmm? No, that's, those things are free. Oh, yes, the increment messages themselves that we're sending here, they cost also. We only account for the potential that they have to send in addition to sending the increment message. 
So the increment message cost one each uh, should be 16. Okay, I think you'll appreciate the inference that Jan's program does after all of this. <laughs> okay, now type checks, okay? And I would claim if you say 15, then it doesn't type check. Yeah. And you say it says two greater or equal to three there, right? So it basically means we're like one thing short, right? So you can read those error messages and make some deduction from them, but okay. Now we figured it out. Now the next thing is I want to convert this into binary form. So proc um, binary eight, and that should be a binary number. Um, and maybe we need to put some potential on that. Okay. How do we get the binary number eight? We do eight, oops, equals eight in parallel with the val message and then forward. Okay. Now how much potential do we need for that? So we need 16 for sure plus plus 2 plus 1. What are the 2 plus 1? The value is 2, right? Value is 2. So the message itself is 1. Ah, okay, the message itself is 1. Okay. I think our implementation can do arithmetic. So 16 plus 2 plus 1. Are we believe that? Okay. Yay. Okay. Okay. This is oddly satisfying, isn't it? Okay. We can count. We can count to nineteen. Okay. Um, okay. So, but anyway, the type checking guarantees that our amortized analysis goes correct, right? And if I maintain a counter that I can ask the value of, then I just have, you know, it's still constant time, right? And in fact, I know what exactly the amortized constant is. It's three. And then when I retrieve the value, I need exactly two fixed number more to get the value out. Okay, I think that's really remarkable um, that you can do that in this, in this tiny language. So to recap on this before I move on, um, we can do amortized analysis by um, allowing a process to hold a certain amount of potential, in this case constant, okay, two and three, and we also allowing, um, and we can pass potential around. We can send and receive potential between processes that are connected along a channel. And we use that here because the outside world sends in potential along this channel together with an increment message or a value message. Okay. Um, and actually, you can also do this with variables. You can say something requires a potential of R. Um, so as long as everything is linear, okay, it will still work out the arithmetic. So underneath, there is a Pressburg arithmetic decision procedure. But I'm not going to exercise that now because I want to go back to the counter. Okay. And I want to analyze instead, let's call this counter dash time. Okay. Let's get actually rid of the counters. Okay, so it shouldn't be called counters anymore. Um, but let's not change the name. Okay, so what I want to do now is implement the pro the, this pipeline okay, um, that increments the binary number that comes through. Okay? So the increment or plus one is a process which has tied binary number to binary number. So how do we, oops, plus one, how do we program that? Okay. So we kind of did this. I think we did this, not just kind of, we did it exactly. So how does this work? Do we, do we read a bit from the left or from the right? Left. left, because it's an external choice, right? So do we a case left, and it could be B0, or it could be B1, or it could be E, right? Okay, if I receive B0 from the left, what do I do? I send B1 in which direction? B1 to the right, and then the rest of the stream is not affected, so forward, okay? If I get a B1, then what do I do? I send to the right, B0, and then 
I have to recurse, right? Because I have to carry out the carry. And if I see an E, we send B1 to the right, and then we can't forward at this point because after we receive the E, the type on the left is 1, and the type on the right is bin, right? So we send E. And then we say, well, OK, we wait on the left, and then we close the right. Or we can forward, right? So let's just do it this way, OK? Does that code make sense? Everybody believe this code? OK. Um, actually, we should probably type check it. Um, just a suspicious mind. Counter dash time. OK, type checks, good. Um, okay, so now I want the proc, what did we have there before? Six has type bin, doesn't depend on anything, proc six. What did the process six looks like here? R dot B zero, okay. R dot B one, R dot B one. So it looks like we're doing it in reverse, right? But okay, fine. R dot E, thing is finished, and then we close. Make sense? OK. So let's execute that. OK. So in the final state, actually now we have, instead of the dollar sign, the at sign. The at sign stands for a message. So we have a message instead of a process. The first message that comes along that channel on the right is B0, then B1, B1, then E, and then it's closed. Okay, that's what that means. So that is the number six bit by bit. Okay. All right, so now we want to increment that. My examples are getting somewhat repetitive, um, but um, how do we get eight? Well, we took six in parallel with plus one, in parallel with plus one, right? And then we execute eight. Okay. Was there a mistake? Okay, no. Okay, good. Yeah, and there's the number eight, right? One, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so we did it right. Okay, so that's it all well and good, but now we want to do an an analysis of the timing for this. Okay? And intuitively what should happen is that an increment it reads a bit from the left, and then one unit of time later, it puts it out to the right. So we're going to do this by the following. The options, we say dash dash, um, what do we say? Time equals receive. So we have a different cost model. Is every receive now in this costs one unit of time? Intuitively, that's because when, before you receive something, you have blocks. So that's the expensive operation. OK, so time is receive. Okay. So if we run it now, it should definitely not type check anymore because we're not accounting for that. OK, so then the binary number type looks differently. It looks like we, we receive bit zero in one unit of time later. So that's my, my rendition of a circle, OK? From temporal logic, which means at the next time. OK, so at the next time, and here at the next time we close, OK? This is the fastest you can possibly do, right? You have to have one unit time delay. OK, so then the plus one takes a binary number, and at the next time produces a binary number on the right. OK? Um, and let's comment out these examples. OK? All right, so if we did, if we played our cards right, then this will touch check. OK? But I already know that it won't. OK? Um, so unfortunately, the error message I already also know will not be very enlightening, okay? But we'll still do it, okay? Um, okay, so it couldn't synthesize any types for delay followed by R to B1 followed by forward, okay? So that indicates that there's a problem in that line where we do a delay, then R to B1, and then forward. The delay, by the way, comes from the cost model that's inserted into the code before we type check it. It's inserted right after the receive. So let's actually look, look at what happens here. OK, let's do the type. I haven't given you the typing rules, but let me actually point out what happens here. So 
After we receive B0, okay, when we start, we have bin and circle bin on the right. After we receive B0, what do we have on the left? Circle bin, right? Why do we have next time bin? Because the, the continuation at type 0 is going to be circle bin, right? So that's going to be the type on the left. And on the right, we haven't interacted, so this is still of type circle bin. Okay, does that make sense as a, as a type here after one step of interaction? Now, that interaction costs one unit of time, so the delay which is inserted here means that we have to move forward time on all channels. Okay? So after you move forward the time on all channels, then it's going to be this type. Okay? And that's because time is like a global thing because we're doing parallel time. So all processes can step forward at the same time. So it's not a local operation the way it was with uh, potentials. Okay. So the good news is that now the right-hand side has type bin. Okay? So that means we can actually send B1. So then the right-hand side, after B1, it has the type circle bin, right? Because you see the continuation type after you send B1 is circle bin. So now it means at the next time, you have to send another bin. So now the forward doesn't type check, because on the left-hand side, we have bin. On the right-hand side, we have circle bin. Okay. So intuitively, the forward is too fast. It, it, doesn't, it connects those two channels, okay? and there's no delay. But there's supposed to be a delay because at that point, the output is going to be one step slower than the input. But it's not iffy forward, right? Because we identify the two channels and then they come across really fast. So what we need to do is we need to write a copy which goes from bin to circle bin. And copy is just, I've written this so many times, I'm just going to write it. I'm sure you could. We do a case left. If we see B0, we output B0 and then we copy. If we see B1, we output B1 and then we copy. And if we see E, then we output E. Then we wait on the left for it to finish. Um, and then we close to the right. Okay. And then here, we call copy. And copy has the right type because it actually outputs one bit one time unit later, so it doesn't necessarily delay. Okay? So let's see. It still doesn't type check, I can tell you already. Sorry about that, but let's see what happens. Okay, so now the error is somewhere else. It can't reconcile um, the typing for the delay B1, E, wait left, delay, close R. So that means actually the error is now in the last branch of this. Okay, so it's actually, this one is okay now, the first one is okay, and the second one is okay, but this branch is wrong. And why is it wrong? Because I do two consecutive outputs on the right without anything in between. Okay. And so what you have to do is you have to switch the order of these two. So first you wait on the left, and then you output on the right. So that this, this uh, choreography where you take one, put one, take one, put one is being respected rather than take one, put out two, wait for two, okay. So now, if I'm right, it should type check. Okay, so now it type checked. So now we actually have a, a temporally synchronized program here. So we don't actually have to wait for the message to arrive because the incoming stream is exactly synchronized with the plus one process. And whatever we plug that in is synchronized exactly also in time. Okay. So this is synchronous flow. Okay, so let's write, see if we can do the example six and eight. So six should give us a binary number without any delay. Why? Because the first thing it does it output be zero. Now at this point it has to pause, it doesn't want to be too fast. But the type checker can figure that out and insert the delay. It says, okay, we'll wait for one unit of time. Okay. So that should actually work out. So let's check that. OK, so it works out. And now when it prints the output, it tells you at what time point the message has arrived. So B0 comes at time 0, B1 at time 1, B2 at time 2, or 
E at time 3 and the close R at time 4. Okay. Now, last thing to type check here is this one. Okay, so that type is not correct for 8. Anybody see why? Yeah, the plus means one time delay, right? So how long does it take until the number arrives on the right-hand side? Like that, right? Okay. Um, let's try that. Okay. It type checks and, in fact, it also executes correctly. Okay. And now you see the first B0 arrives at time unit 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. After that, they come really fast. Okay. Okay, so I think um, this is certainly not all this, the whole story. So there's other things. You can put variables in these things, and it will solve some equations between them. So you can make bits coming in rate r and go out at rate r plus 1, things of that nature. Um, as long as you stay linear, it will be able to solve them. Um, now, another effect is that let's think about if you wanted to compress runs of zeros, what would be the type of that? Okay. So the problem is we cannot take a stream of binary numbers and retrieve astronomy numbers with this particular type, okay? Because we don't actually know how many consecutive zeros there are. So we can't actually really predict when we're going to output the next number if we see a zero. It could be very long, right? Make sense? Um, so what we need for that is we need another type. It looks like this um, type. I'm not going to show you the whole, whole co code, just the type. So slow bits is going to be an internal choice. And there's still going to be B0 and B1. But now we need what's in temporal logic called a diamond, which means at some future time. Okay. So with a delay of 1, which we always have, after that, we don't know when. We know at least at some unit of time, we get another slow set of bits. And if we have a B1, and after, after one step at least, but then we don't know when, but at some time in the future we get another one. And similarly for E, except for E, I think um, we can immediately close it so we don't need to wait arbitrarily. So the type for the slow bits looks something like this. Okay. Um, and then compress, which I'm not going to write here now, is going to have the type it takes bits of stream, even if they come in very regularly. Um, okay, actually, sorry, binary number. Even though it comes in very regularly on the output side, it's going to produce, with a delay of one, some very irregular stream. Okay? And then the type checker will verify that this is really the case. Okay, so right now, of course, this won't run through. Um, and then we have a counterpart of that, which is a box, which you would use for the counter. Let's say you have a data structure like a counter. If I just say we have a counter in the context, you would be forced to send it like an increment message like on every single step, right? Because, well, it's once an input. So what you put there is um, at any time in the future, you can send it, whatever you want. And that's where the box type comes in. So in the final type system, we also have box and we have diamond and we have the circle. And we also have the two things that transfer potentials between different processes. Um, Limitation is that everything must be completely inside Pressburg arithmetic. If you try to go outside a Pressburg arithmetic, then it won't be able to solve anything. Um, are there questions about the implementation or the code or anything else? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so we can give a more precise type if we want to take advantage of that. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Okay, well, the implementation is, is online, and uh, all you need in order to be able to run it is standard ML from New Jersey, or no, standard ML, period. Um, and um, I program in standard ML, even though it's not cool right now, but. The nice thing about it is that it's a completely dead language. 
Okay. So that means my code from 20 years ago still compiles and runs. Okay. My OCaml code, you know, every month I have to update it. Okay. So I don't have any libraries, okay, but I'll just write them myself. But at least I know things will never change, okay, um, which is a very nice property to have. Um, so feel free to play with any questions or comments or whatever. Uh, send them in. I'm eager to hear them. Okay, thank you very much.